Anyway, so just to start off, I'll just give you a little sample. Uh, uh, this is what, and, and, and what I took of her is very short, but here's what Irma said to me. Um, uh, the, uh, Daniel and Beatriz Talamante Reese brought their family from Texas to Gilroy in 1943. Two of their sons had been sent to the West Coast by the Army, Enrique to training at Fort Ord and Daniel to Fort Lewis, Washington. The parents wanted to stay close to their sons, so they and their, how many daughters? Uh, four daughters. Four daughters. And five brothers. Four and five, oh my God. Five brothers. Okay, yeah. anyway, uh, came to Gilroy and, op and they opened a market on Post, post Street, Post Office Market, um, which was named Street. because it was next to the Post Office. Across. Across. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, if one were to go to Gilroy City Hall, the shortest route through the back door was through the store uh, from the Gilroy City Hall to the post office. So Mr. and Mrs. Reese came to know all the politicians and elected officials in town. Even my remembers going around town passing out election campaign materials for the various candidates that her parents were supporting for elected office. Because it was wartime, there were soldiers and strangers everywhere around town, and the Mexican mothers were concerned that the girls needed guidance and activities to keep them entertained and supervised. The mothers helped found Gardenias de Gilroy. They met in people's homes and backyards. Ima remembers that the women and girls made enchiladas and held car washes to raise money for the girls to have birthday parties and to take trips to the beaches on the coast. The Gardenias also raised $500 to bring popular Tejano band leader Beto Villa to Wheeler Auditorium in Gilroy. The money they raised was also used to host quinceaneras, showers for engaged girls, or to give gifts to those girls who were getting married. The Jardenias also took part in the annual Fiestas Patrias, 16th of September, and Cinco de Mayo parades and fiestas in San Jose. These activities involve planning, decorating cars and floats, uh, and Mexican folklorico dancing. It was the perfect reason for the girls to go and meet and plan, to go to meetings and planning events in the big city. Irma's parents would let the girls go, but they had to take Lil Irma with her, with them. <laughs> After the war, Irma's brothers and relatives opened businesses in San Jose, such as the Balcony Lounge and Joe's Place. Irma said that her parents brought and ran a small hotel in Gilroy. Irma herself has worked and continued to improve her own professional career. Her education included attending Avilan College, UC Santa Cruz, National Hispanic University, and University of Phoenix. She worked in, every, in, in entry level positions at McCormick and Company and rose to become a trainer in the research and development division. That's just a tiny little bit that I'm saying. Any time, any sentence in there, you can go 10 different yeah. places. Yeah. You know, you name the McCormick, and somebody else told me about Gentry and you know, they st or they start naming other people. Yeah. Was it so Gentry's Gentry incorporated to Gilbert Foods? Oh, that was way later. Oh, but yeah, Gilbert Foods it was, were both it was called the Gentry uh, Food Division, okay? Oh, okay? And the president of, uh, it, eventually the president of Gilbert Foods, which was George Clausen, okay, his stepfather owned Gentry Foods. Okay. Okay, then there was a group of uh, some three farmers and three businessmen, George Clausen among them, and they started Gilroy Foods. So then Gentry became our competitor. Oh, okay. And we were subsidized because we belonged to McCormick and Company from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. Okay. As the years went by, George Clausen left, Gilroy Foods bought Gentry Foods Division, oh, okay. who then the president was Gene Blattman. George Clausen retired to Baltimore, and Gene Blattman became president of both together. So that's kind of the history of the both. Well, because I had a brother, my brother Henry worked for Gentry Foods Division for 41 years and you know and they did not like it if you called them Gilroy Foods. They continued to have that identity 
Thank we you. are gentry people. Yeah, my brother Frank worked in there, mm -hmm. worked for gentry. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I, I started at Gilroy Foods working nights from 8 at night to 5 in the morning. That was my shift when I first started. God, there was a lot of hours. No, I was eight to five, but it, at night. Oh, at night. So long. <laughs> it was eight to five, but at night, yeah. And uh, and then eventually, after two or three years, I came on a shift and went to work for research and development. That was my first day job. <laughs> and then progressed from there to different departments. But I always had a love of manufacturing. Every time they would threaten to put us in another department, like HR or whatever. No, 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 no. You keep it. Manufacturing to me was the heart of the company. That was where things happened. You put out a product you could see and touch and smell. And that's where I wanted to be, manufacturing. So I became the first woman supervisor in manufacturing because they had women in quality control, women in marketing, uh, supervisors in inventory control, but manufacturing was a male dominated oh. environment. <laughs> so when I was offered the position, I was, they didn't say it in so many words, but the understanding was whoever we select has to succeed. And it was difficult because this was a union teamsters environment okay. and everybody thought, oh those guys are not going to take orders from a woman you know that was their pitch right and uh, i asked my husband if i should take the job and he told me i'll never forget what he said if you don't take it they'll never offer it again and number two, you'll be opening the door for other women to go into manufacturing. So I took it. And the rest is history, <laughs> as they say. About what year is it that you became a manager? I would say, let's see, I started in 1967, in the 70s. Because from research and development, I went to manufacturing engineering as an analyst, operations analyst. Then they offered me a position in management and packaging as a supervisor. And then from there, I became um, like, uh, it was the era of total quality managing. And so they said, we have to train everyone in this. And I said, I need help, <laughs> you know. But before I went into that, I, would, I worked nine years in maintenance. So when did you retire? In 2000, no, the end of 1999. See, now I have more writing to do. <laughs> Meanwhile, and we can do this for hours oh, and hours and more There's and more and more. There's just a lot of stories. But at this time, I don't have story. a lot of facts and well, dates. Oh no! I'll just ask you. So, um, who, are, who are your parents? And okay, my parents. Grandparents. Atencion Perez, and my mom's name was Della. Her maiden name was Barboa. My mom was California Indian. So, everybody said, "What kind of last name is that?" <laughs> mm. and, uh, yeah. We were a big family. I had 11 brothers and four sisters. So there was 15 of us in the family. And we were raised on 4th and Rosanna, right down town in Kilroy. My mom and dad came from um, Porterville, California in 1940, 1940. And they settled here in Gilroy. Um, they lived out right out going south of um, Gilroy on your right hand side, where there's a restaurant called Sandy's there now. Uh, right across the street, there was Big Prune Orchard. And the original house from the owner, George Schreffer, 
He was the owner, German man, and his daughter lived in that house, and that house is still there. Mm -hmm. The house is still there, and his sister lived down, down the, the road there, and her name was Mrs. Hong Zhang, and her house is still there. The two houses are still there. And there, he had a daughter named Barbara, Barbara Schreffer, and uh, she still owns that land. The trees, I mean, the orchards are all gone, There's so it's nothing but prune orchards there. And uh, it's, it was quite a big place, and they had a, like a little migrant camp down the road as you're going into the orchards. There was a migrant camp, and every year the same families would come and pick the prunes. And uh, we, we lived in a, a little house that was the, uh, his, uh, Mr. Schreffer's uh, other little house there. We lived there, and my aunt lived across the way from us. So family lived there, and we also picked the prunes every summer. And uh, as we grew up, there was like three sets of Bettises. The older Bettises, there was like my sister Carmen, my brother Ralph, my si brother Raymond, my sister Annie, and my brother Frank. They were the first group. And the second group, it was me, my sister Linda, my brother Nestor, my brother Gabriel, and my brother, oh God, who was the next one? Gabriel and Peter. That was the next group. And the following group was my brother um, Daniel, and then there was Michael, and then there was uh, Richard, Andrew, and Stephen. So we were all, they were all, we had like three groups. The first group got older and moved away, got married, left. The second group came about and then they also came about and then they moved away. So there was three groups of us. So everybody says there were so many, there were 15 children in the family and how did your mom do it? I says, well, she, she raised three groups of children, okay? So. Mark, excuse me, did your, um, wh do, why did your parents settle Hi. in, uh, why did they settle in, uh, in Gilroy? Because my, I had uncles, two uncles and aunts that lived here in Gilroy at that time, and they kept telling my mom, move to Gilroy, move, <laughs> move to Gilroy. Gilroy. That's what happened they were to us. Uh, yes. So my, uh, my dad finally gave in and says, okay, going to Gilroy. So the first group came to Gilroy. There was five already in the family when they first came. And they settled and uh, my uncles um, had the place for them, for, for us to come and uh, had a place for us to live and work for my dad, there was work. And so that's why we came to Gilroy. What were your dad and mother's name and where, did, where were they born? Okay, my dad's name was Ascension Perez. My dad was born in the state of Jalisco, Guadalajara. Okay. My mom, her name was Della Barboa. My mom was born in Fireball, California. That's where they were born. Uh, my mom, my dad worked at the time when they first met, um, my dad worked for the railroad. And he lived in, um, Visalia, and my mom uh, grew up and went to school in Fireball. She walked three miles a day back and forth to school, so we were told. <laughs> Did your father, um, wh which railway? Southern Pacific? Southern Santa Pacific. Fe? He worked for Southern Pacific. And did he come with a job from Southern Pacific, or he came and no. then got the job? No, my dad came from Mexico, from Jalisco. He was uh, 16 years old, mm -hmm. and he came by himself. And he landed in Chicago, and he worked, and he 
that's where he got it, started working for the railroad. And he worked himself across the states until he landed in California. He didn't know anybody here when he got to California? No. Never did know. But he made friends. And he, he lived in uh, Visalia at the time. Him and my mom met. My mom was visiting uh, her godparents. And the, her godfather brought my, had already met my dad. So he invited him to the house to have dinner. So my mom was there at the time. My mom was only 14 years old when she met my dad. My dad was 21 at that time. So uh, they met and they eventually got married. And they lived, oh, and they moved to Porterville at that time. And they worked for, my dad worked for um, a vineyard that was named, um, my, oh, what was the name of it? It was a very famous. Uh, um, Almaden Vineyard? No, it was Lombardi's. At that time in Porterville, Lombardi was mm -hmm. very well known um, vineyard place where they made the best wines at that time. And um, yeah, that's where they lived. And they lived in the little, the rancher gave them their little house and, you know, they just started having children. The first group was, born, the, four, the first five were born there in, in uh, Porterville. And which, where, where were you in line and when were you born? I was born in 1941 in uh, Gilroy. In, um, were you the fifth or sixth or seventh? I was the, <laughs> let's see, Carmen, F, Ralph, Raymond, Frankie, Annie. I was six. Out six. of a total of? Fifteen. Fifteen. Yes. So where did you go to elementary schools? And I went to Elliott when I first started. What is that? Elliott School. Elliott. Uh -huh. And then I went, I, when we moved into t town, I went to Jordan, Jordan School. There was a school in Jordan at one time, to Brownell, and then to high school. So, and then, um, yeah, I had those yeah, the school. So I think I, I think they're all mm -hmm. gone except for Brownell. Did you graduate from high school? Yes. And which one? Gilroy High. Gilroy High, in 1959. And then what did you do after high school? I got married. <laughs> in yeah. which year? I got married in 1961. So uh, had three children. Uh, who, two girls and a boy. My uh, kids all, my three, well, my oldest one, her name was Dalla, named after my mom. My son is Jassy Luna, and my, and my daughter is Rita Luna, but we call her Pumpkin also. <laughs> and my daughter, my oldest one, we call her Peanut. That's what you forgot, even though they had 15 kids, they were able to buy a house at 4th and Hannah? 4th and Rosanna. Oh, Rosanna and yes. a big yard for 15 kids. We had, it was a big house. Big house, big We yard. had to have a big house for all the kids. <laughs> but like I told you, um, the first group left because they were the old, older ones. My oldest sister got married and my brother, my, my brother, Ralph got married and left, then my brother Raymond went to the service, and then it was Annie, she got married in a couple years after my brother Raymond left, and then it was Frank, and he also went to the service. How many uh, brother, how many of your brothers served in the military? I was Raymond, Frankie, Gabriel, uh, my brother Nestor, I think those were it, just the four. Four. Yeah. And two of them were in Vietnam. Yes. Two of my brothers were in Vietnam. I don't, see, I don't know where my brother Raymond was. I know he was stationed at Fort Ord, but I don't remember where he went. He, it was no war at that time when he was there. 
and also my brother Frank. He went to the Navy. So when you got married and had the kids, what, did you work also? I didn't work until my uh, my oldest one was three years old. My mom only lived a half a block away from us, so my mom would watch her. I, I worked. I started working at, uh, gosh, what was my first job? I worked at uh, Woolworth for a while. Then I, I worked that. at, uh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. and then I worked at, um, gosh, oh, God. Margaret is a fellow educator like you, Ron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I worked at, um, let's see, I worked at 88 cent stores. I worked for Mr. Pratt at the pharmacy also. And this was all, and then I worked at a bakery. Then I worked in another pharmacy, which was over on Murray. A lot of people don't um, even remember that pharmacy. It was uh, right next to, to where the uh, convalescent home is there now. The pharmacy went up first. There was no convalescent home. There was still the orchard, the prune orchard there. And the high school was across the way. And. Uh, and I worked there at that. So which streets are now that location? They're still, it's Murray Avenue. That's where the, uh, that pharmacy was. And the convalescent home is still there. And it, it's been there for quite a while. And, mm -hmm. and now you used to have to deliver the medication to the, to the hospital after it was, it was uh, built. And, um, they had... Um, but how many years did you work for the school district? Oh, yeah, well, later on, after I had my three children, I I got hired. To, I went to work for the school. Doing what? I started off as a para, and uh, I work. started off working three hours because that's all I wanted, because I still have my kids who are still young, and I wanted to be there for them when they got left for school and when they came home from school. So I worked there um, for 35 years. Where? At, 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 uh, in which schools did you okay, work? Okay, I started off working at San Isidro School, which was sort of like a country school out in Pacheco Pass. I was there for about five years. I went to Elliott School, which is still there, but not the original one. They have a nice new one. Nice new one. Yeah, and I worked there at Elliott. You're welcome. And then from there I went to El Robles School, which is on 3rd Street, it's still in existence. And, uh, and then from there I went into a special program that the state had uh, developed. It was called Even Start, and I was a family advocate. There I worked 12 years. And were all these schools elementary schools, basically? Yes, all elementary. What did you like about working with I love the uh, working from kindergarten to uh, third grade. No higher. I would not go any higher because <laughs> 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 nowadays you can't even go into kindergarten, first grade. I mean, it's the, the, the kids are so, <laughs> I don't know how do you say it. But they're not like they were in those days. They were very respectful, very good kids. And now it's really different. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you think about your life in Gilroy, what are three of the highlights of your life living here? Three of the highlights. Oh, my gosh. Now, I know that's real hard to do. Yeah. Just... Don't I worry. had my brothers, we you know, I want to tell you. I'm already little, here talking, by the way. I shouldn't be talking. Go ahead. Three I want to tell you about my brothers. I had 11 brothers. And out of the 11, um, eight of them were baseball players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Growing up. Daniel. Yeah. There was, uh, when we moved into 4th and Rosanna, down the street there was a family named Cordage. And Mr. Cordage, Mr. Slim Cordage, we called him Slim. He was um, an ex-baseball um, coach. So when my brother started growing up, 
it was the, the younger group, they uh, would play over at this uh, condemned Severance School at that time. <laughs> it was still standing, the old Severance School. It was a beautiful school, but they had condemned it. So the boys would go over there and play baseball. And pretty soon, Mr. Cordage was coming over and coaching them. So they were, could walk. They were out there playing baseball. At the end, uh, well, at, in my family, all the, from, there was only nine boys were the last part of the family. So they were all boys that were playing baseball. And, um, and they all became baseball players. And my mom and dad would go to the games to see them. And at that time, I had, they had one brother playing against the other brother. <laughs> so my mom had to, my dad had to take their chairs and sit in between them. <laughs> and he couldn't sit up in the top and root for one, one team and not for the other. So that's, you know, they, and up, they played baseball up to they couldn't play anymore. In fact, they played in the old, the senior, they called the senior league where the old seniors play. And I still have two of them that still do that. You know, there's... They were good athletes. Oh, yeah. They they were into... Did any of them ever play in the, in the baseball leagues that were connected to San Jose that used to appear in the ma Eccentrico magazine? I'm not sure, but I could ask my brother. Nestor, he was the one that was more involved. In fact, I have two of my brothers who became umpires because of the level of the game. They couldn't play anymore. But the empire. So yeah. You laugh anyway. <coughs> when they first got married, she was fourteen. Yeah. Oh. And yeah. she didn't know how to cook. Her her husband, you know, she was a teeny little lady. Yeah. Her husband was kind of husky and big, so her brothers were the same. And uh, he, the her dad gave her mother money to go. Shopping. I buy. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. One. <laughs> and uh, she went and she shopping with a friend, and they bought a doll, uh, jacks, you know, things that Jump little roll. girls <laughs> like. Yeah. And when her dad got home, he's you know there was no kids at the time. He goes, "Where's the food?" And she goes, "What food?" She goes, "I gave you money to go buy food." She didn't know how to cook or anything, so <laughs> she she would go to, um, you know, the Okies were coming from Oklahoma <laughs> from the Dust Bowl. She would go over there and learn how different ways of cooking yeah. different cheap things to eat. <laughs> so those are, and, and I used to see them at the, all the baseball games. Yeah. Uh, you know, I knew her parents. Yeah. But, yeah, I just wanted to share especially about... That, that she she it bought so little young. girl things and she was supposed to buy food. <laughs> yeah, there was another one when my mom was a very, um, I mean, if you tell my mom, no, you can't do it, she would find a way how to do it. Mm -hmm. So when they lived in Porterville and the, my dad was gone to work, they had, my mom and dad had a car, but it would stay there at the house. My dad would take up truck to work and uh, she always wanted to learn how to drive and my dad would take her to buy groceries or take her to buy whatever you know and she would watch him how he and those days it was a model T she told us and she would watch how he drove the, the car Hello, baby. and he she kept asking him when are you gonna teach right. me how to drive he says oh okay. tomorrow uh -huh. tomorrow I'll, I'll teach you right. So one day she just decided, okay, I think I can, I think I can drive the car. So she got into the car, started it up, got in, and the car started just going in circles, <laughs> in circles, and she didn't know how to straighten it out. So she finally decided, okay, this is how I want to straighten out. She turned the wheel, and when she did that, she hit the side of the barn and broke her arm and messed up the car. <laughs> and the and the farm uh, the ranchers 
wife heard what heard the noise, so she came running out. And so she says, I have to go get your husband. So they went and got him. He came back and took her in to the doctor. They had to put, her, put a cast on her arm and everything. And finally, my dad tells her, okay, I'm going to teach you how to try. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, Eleanor. Okay, let, let me listen to Eleanor a little bit, then I'll turn a little bit. Just tell me who you are and... I'm Eleanor Villarreal. I'm originally, I was born in San Francisco. I grew up in Hollister. Uh, I work with my grandfather in Hollister in the, in the mostly orchards. And um, I used to see immigrant people, migrant people, sleeping under trees, cooking under the apricot trees. I'd see that all summer long. And then they'd go somewhere else. So I just wanted to add that, you know, because even though we didn't have the best house in the world, we had a roof over our head and we could sleep inside. They were sleeping under trees mm -hmm. and I was shocked to see that as a small girl, you know, eight years old and up. Uh, I don't know what else you want to hear about me, but it's well, not about me today. <laughs> no, but no, we'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit more about you. But right now, you were talking, you, 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 all you ladies are mentioning the Sanchez, Sanchez family. What, tell me what we're talking okay. about. What's that? The Sanchez girls, Mary, Lupe, and Carmen, grew up in uh, Catalina Island in Southern California. And the dad came up here probably in the late 30s and sent for them and brought them over here. And they lived in this drive-by Monterey and 2nd Street next to the Bank of America. Big, giant blue house with two stories plus a full basement. They lived there. And they were very devout in the Catholic Church. Uh, Mary was the only one that got married and she became a hairdresser and she had her own shop for a long long time And then she moved upstairs into that house on the corner of 2nd and Monterey um, uh, And they had a little religious kind of little shop with flowers and vases and little things and and ran their business out of the house there all, a very devout in the Catholic Church in St. Mary's. They did lots of stuff there, lots and lots of volunteer work, of course, attended there. And um, Lupe and Carmen, from their father, accumulated some property over, uh, I don't know if you all know where Murray Avenue is. Well, that's <coughs> where they... Mur Murray Avenue, north of Leedsley. Yeah, there was a low-income housing built. I say low-income because now it's not low-income, but anyway, it was. And they gave some of that property over there. You know, Father Burke was at St. Mary's School, and one of the streets is named Burke Street, and the rest is named after dead presidents, Lincoln and Garfield and et cetera. Anyway, uh, so they gave the land for Burke Street. Oh, I was just saying that this Carmen, they bought that house, but the parents, where, where he was before he brought them and the girls, was on Murray Avenue, and that's where they had their house. And the house was later knocked down. But you know where the, that house with the tower, I don't know if they knocked that down too on Murray. Well, they did. Yeah, they but right it. across the street, because we used to go and visit there and um, I was just a little girl but m my my parents were very good friends of theirs and then it was Lupe and Carmen they got the house they, on second and church but yeah they they ended up donating some of their property for that go ahead there was okay. a, getting back to the Sanchez there was a it was a three girls but then there was a brother yes. Jesus, Jesus and Vincent Okay, and the um, I was part of the the, the housing project that, that was in Burke Drive, and what happened is that we couldn't get any property. Anyone in Kyoto, nobody wanted welfare recipients yeah, next to them. Nobody wanted uh, farm workers next to them. And the Sanchez, they had that property, but they also had some on Balsa Road where we used to migrate and go over there. 
because we lived in their ranch for about eight years on and up during the summer. And so then uh, Lupe and Carmen were very, um, very devoted to the church and to the city of Gilroy. Carmen was a nun. She actually became a nun. And then she got sick and she, le she left. She left the nunhood. And they, um, so what they did is they donated the property, but like they sold it like really cheap, like a really? dollar an acre or whatever. And the very first <coughs> low-income housing that we built was called Burke Drive after Father Burke, Ronald Burke, and he just died like five years ago. Uh, but the the other two brothers, Louis and, uh, and, and we used to call him Jesus and, and Jesse, they were they were ranchers in Gilroy, and uh, they had their brother Vincent. Vincent went to war. And when Vincent went to war, he was captured in World War II. And he was a prisoner of war, and everybody thought he had died. They had, the, the U.S. military came and told the family he had died, so they had the whole services and everything for Vincent. But at the end of the war, Vincent was found alive. And uh, I was real good friends with Vincent, because when I worked at San Jose, he'd give me a ride every day. And he used to talk about how he survived during the war was that when they had him in, in the camps up there in, in Germany. prison in Germany, that they would give him very little food. But the prison itself was surrounded by nopales. And so what he would do is he would cut the nopales and clean them and boil them. And that the, the gabacho um, uh, prisoners would say, you're crazy, you're going to poison yourself, you know, it, it's poison. He'd say, yeah, let me, let me die, let me die with the nopales. He goes, and that's how he survived. And he goes, after a while, they, since he didn't die, they would ask him, can you make a, can you make a, can we have some of that little plant? Yeah. And then after that, he came back and he worked for EDD. Yep. And then his son became a, a school board, which is very. His, but, which son? Uh, I call him Jerry. Uh, Gary, Gary Sanchez. Gary was Sanchez. Yeah. Gary Sanchez was on the Gary School Board. Was his son? Yeah. But uh, Louis and Marshall. Ran Louis the con a, no, it wasn't Louis. Who? Marshall's whose son? Um, he ran for Congress. Even he's in Arizona now. Yeah. No, I, I no, yeah. I know that. Uh, Louis one of son, the younger ones. Louis and uh, little Louis still is right there on on Forest, Forest and Walnut, and he has a trucking, those trucks that you see there, oh, that's the their trucks. truck. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then they adopted a son named Joey, but I don't know where Joey is now. Mm -hmm. In and fact, Eleanor, Eleanor uh, nominated Lupe Sanchez for the yeah, Hall of it. Fame. Yeah, there, there's the Hall of Fame here in Gilroy, and of course, dead white people were always <laughs> Uh, the winners of the Hall of Fame, and um, one year, Dr. Arviso, Dr. John Arviso here in Gilroy said, why aren't there any Hispanic people? They were here first. And uh, so he and Bob Dyer, one of the, who just died about not even two weeks ago, uh, got into, you know, arguments, <laughs> and worse than that, about why aren't there any Hispanics? And so what he did win out of that, Dr. RV, so I mean, was that they would uh, induct all the ranchos. Gilroy was once, when the Spaniards were here, uh, five, how do you call it, uh, five... Um, California. Land grants? Yeah, there's a land grant. Well, five. Whatever, I forget what they call it. But anyway, uh, you should know, Lupe, you work for this city. What? Which? All the, the five so original the, ranchos. Well, ranchos. Well, okay. Rancho La well, the Spaniards came Rancho and grabbed the land. And uh, so oh, yeah. what Dr. Visu got out of the Chamber of Commerce Hall of Fame was to put the five ranchos. So every year, one of the ranchos would be inducted in. And the, the group that's known as the Californios were descendants of the original rancho owner, the, you know, the owners. And it would be the Castro family, the Ortega family, you know, a bunch of them. And John and I, Arviso, met with them. And boy, they had stories. 
and uh, lots of them. And then, um, uh, let's see, and then um, later on, I nominated the Sanchez sisters, well, Lupe, because she was really the main one that did a lot in the community. Oh, Carmen yeah. mostly worked with the church, and she would go on missions and s in the Southern Americas, you know, she would go yeah, on, on missions for the church and things like that. But Lupe de expanded out a lot more. She was on the board of the Hispanic Chamber. She uh, took cancer patients to their appointments because there's nothing in Gilroy. They had to be transported to San Jose and stuff like that. She did all that. Nobody knew about it. She just quietly did that kind of thing. So <clears throat> I nominated her and I named all these different things that she was involved with and that she did. And they passed her up for this lady that lived over here on Fifth Street. Her name was Mary Preen. She was married to an older doctor from the original Wheeler Hospital that was built in 1929. And she was a nurse at Wheeler Hospital. That's probably how she met him. Uh, she was a curator at the Gilroy Museum. Those were paid positions. She never did one lick of volunteer work. And their excuse was they were afraid she was going to die, so they gave it to her instead of Lucas <laughs> Sanchez. So from the Hispanic Chamber, she was awarded, and Dr. John Perez, who worked for her when he was a kid, hard-working man, I'll tell you that, and uh, he said there is a greater... Um, a greater, well, meaning God was looking over for her, and she finally got her due while she was still alive, because she wasn't very young either, you know. Oh, she was on the council for aging. Yeah. She was on the council she for was aging. The first she, yeah. Oh, you know, she did. She, she, yeah, she was yeah. on the planning commission. Yeah. She was president of the business and professional women's yes. club. Yes. Yes. There were uh, many business organizations that Lupe was part of. That's right. Not There's her. my connection yeah. was with the, the, the ladies, huh? We were real close to them. Oh my yeah. God. But yeah, I, okay. I know yeah. that Say that all over again. My mom and dad were. Um, Say it again. First came okay. Then they'll come over here. I'll, I'll come over here. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait. I, I have your voice is coming on over here. Wait, hang on. I'll, I'll turn around in a minute. When we first came to Gilroy, we didn't know anybody at all, okay? But the Sanchez family was the first family that befriended my family. And Senor Sanchez invited my father to join the Knights of Columbus because, like Eleanor said, they were very devout Catholics. So every year there they would go to a retreat at St. Francis Retreat in San Juan Batista. And uh, Mary, who, be, who had her beauty salon there at, her, at their house, was my, ma, was my sister Eva's maid of honor, and the brother was her best man. No, not me. Okay. Sally, you were talking about the ranchos that are I, I originally talk a from bit this about area. The Sanchez, though. I know, but first tell, name the ranchos. Well, that I can remember the Rancho San Isidro, Rancho um, Las Animas, Rancho uh, Solis. Solis. Who are the other two? Um, yeah. yeah Solis, San Isidro. But our area right here, Lagas. the actual. What? Yes. No, no, that's Morgan Hill, but the Gilroy, no, the little Gilroy, 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 San Isidro. I have them right there at the office, too. Okay, any more? Any more? But, yeah. Any other ones? It was three for sure that I remember. Okay, the last we'll, time. we'll get back to them. Go ahead and tell me about the Sanchez's. Yeah, what I was going to say is that my whole life I remember El Chavito Market, and that was owned by the Mata family. Yes. You know, with, with you know, mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, now I can give you that. The Mata family. And what would happen with the Sanchez, and I was just a little kid, maybe three or four years old, and it always stayed in my head, and they really impressed me, was that. During right before the election, Lupe and Carmen would put an old, uh, like the deck of cards table out there, and they would register Raza to vote. They were the first people, and like I said, I was maybe three or four years old, but that stayed in my head that they always went out to register people to vote. 
and we worked a, a lot of elections together once I, in this, once I turned 21, I would help them. Yep, the first ones to work with Latinos and Gero. I was too young. Yeah, she's a different <laughs> generation. I'm, I was going to ask a question. Um, as I hear about the Sanchez's, I hear a lot of land. How, anybody know what? where did that come from? Well, you bought it, but it's like... I know, but uh, how, you know, Mexican people buying land. Oh, yeah. What, I, well, for who are these people? For instance, okay, my mother was a Vasquez, okay, and they were migrants out of San Bernardino and they would come all the way up California doing all the different crops. Well, my grandfather believed that it was cheaper to buy a piece of land and build, aunque sea cartones, <laughs> to live on, work the area, and that way when you left, you could sell the piece of land. So he always said, we're not going to rent or live in a migrant camp we're going to buy. So that's how they were all brought up. So they were here, the first time they came to Gilroy was in 1925. And my mother was 10 years old by then, and they had gone all around, but they bought their property in Gilroy. And then when her father died in, I think, 1929, she was 12, so, probably 27, um, they owned a, just like an acre of property out on Pacheco Pass. And so from there, half of the family stayed there and the other half was down in San Bernardino. So the older boys would stay there and then the younger kids would be down there. So they would be a separate family because my grandmother was a widow with nine children. But they always believed in you buy your piece of land, you know, because I don't know what land was worth back in 1925, you know, $100, $80 or whatever. But they always said, you buy your piece of land porque nadie te saca de allí. <laughs> and that's how the family still owns the ranch out on Pacheco Pass. It's the Vasquez Ranch. My Uncle Chino um, was one of the, the first ones to stay there, and he lived out in that ranch most of all of his life almost mm -hmm. and that's out on Pacheco Pass and they had owned that ranch since 1927 and my mother said then they had their house down in San Bernardino and the house down in San Bernardino was a, a large house because they all lived together my my grandma and her sisters and everybody, everybody lived together and she says so the the house my father always said you buy a house and you make it grow so they bought the land next to them. And so when they came up here, it was only natural since they were working in the fields and as migrants that they bought their piece of land. And that was something that all of their, their neighbors knew too, like the Sanchez brothers, you know, they said they were the same thing. You buy your piece of land because nadie te saca de allí. And that's how, now they didn't have big ranches, but they made sure they bought their acre or two, at least an acre to start, and that's how it all began. Unfortunately, they had large families, like my Uncle Chino ended up with 14. You know, my mother had seven, um, so it goes on. So there was a lot of kids, but everybody lived on that ranch at one time or another. And then later on, my right piggyback on the back side of that ranch was the Goopsa Ranch on Fresher Lake. Mm -hmm. And when I was born, mm -hmm. my father worked for um, Joseph, Goopser. Joseph Goopser there. And he lived on one of the houses, but it back it backsided to the Vasquez Ranch on the other side of Pacheco Pass. So that's where the land comes from. You know, there's that, that theory that if you buy your land, at least you have some place and you could migrate from there. And that was the Northern California, the Pacheco Pass property was the Northern California base. And from there they would go up to Lodi and they would go, you know, over to the valley to the peaches and stuff and, and the, the cotton, nuts the cotton, yeah, and the cotton so that they would have a base. So they had a Northern California base and a Southern California base. Um, my mother is a fifth generation um, 
California, you know, so. From, from where? From San Bernardino. Okay. San Bernardino. Tell me more about your Uncle Chino. Ah, oh, what can I tell you oh, about my boy. Uncle Chino? <laughs> There's so much to tell. There is so much to tell. He oh, yeah. was an advocate for the people. My Uncle Chino were, had, like I said, had 14 children. And he just wouldn't let people keep him down. What was his name? Right. <laughs> Donicio Vasquez. Donicio Vasquez Vaca. My, my grandmother was a Vaca. Um, my grandfather was born in California. His, my great grandfather was born in California. The Vasquez were all from California. And on my mother's side, she, her mother was from Arizona, and her great-grandmother was from Arizona, and then my mother was born in California. So anyway, it just went on that way. But uh, my uncle Chino Vasquez just was a marvelous man. Um, he didn't believe that anybody should put you down just because you worked in dirt. He said, just because we're dirty, doesn't mean we don't have a brain and we don't think and we don't have rights. And I think he was so thrilled. I remember him being at the house one day telling us about there was this great movement happening over in the valley. And he met a great guy. And that guy was Cesar Chavez. And he says, this man is in my brain. He says, everything that I've been trying to do here, you know, he's been doing over in the valley. And so my uncle Chino connected with him and brought Trabajadores Adelante. He was, you know, one of the first um, members of uh, the, what is it, the CSO? What was it? Community Service, Community service Organization. And it was on uh, the board of South County Housing, uh, original board. Original board of uh, South County that. Housing. I don't remember the, you there, but yeah, I was But the original board, he, um, like I said, he started the, the chapter of the Brown Berets here in town for the young Latinos. You know, he, he says, you know, don't call yourself Hispanics. You know, the Spaniards oppressed us. You know, he goes, call yourself a Chicano. Call yourself a Mexicano, call yourself a Latino, call yourself whatever you want, but you're not an Hispanic. You oh. know, that was, he, <laughs> he hated that because he said they were our oppressors. Yeah, they tried to keep us down. That was really a political term, Hispanic. Yeah. Right, so, but my Uncle Chino, that's who introduced me to it, you know, n you're not Hispanic. But that's my Uncle Chino and with a lot of other stuff I can yeah. tell you. You, you were, had something to say about Chino? Oh, well, Lupe described him very well. He didn't put up with any, whatever, fill in the blank. Uh, he, you know, if somebody even felt insulted, he spoke up. He wasn't one of those that just stayed real meek and quiet. <laughs> he didn't and, uh, take it. Yeah. And we were on the uh, housing board, which just got taken over. It was started in 1986, and he was on the original board, and so was I. And it just got taken over by a, a Eden, which is a profit-making organization. Oh, and Patty knows about that. She worked there. And um, later in life, Chino got uh, Parkinson's really, really bad and left the area, I guess. Huh, Lupe? He no, 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 he no, no, he no. He stayed? No, no he Really? Stayed. I thought he, he left didn't have Parkinson's. Well. It was, mm -hmm. what's his name, who had Parkinson's and went to Arizona. Um, what was the other man's name? Oh, God, I can't remember his name. But my Uncle Chino didn't have Parkinson's. No, he had, Chino said he he had, had asthma. Sorry. Yeah, he had, he had asthma. asthma. Actually, yeah. that's what he died of. Yeah, he died of his asthma. But Joe Chapa, uh, Jose Chapa, worked with him quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Jose yeah, Jose Chapa Jose Chapa also, just died two years ago. Yeah, and, he, at and he worked at Sierra LA. Yeah. But um, my he Uncle Chino was on... You know, every board you could think of that had to do with housing, you know, way back when the censuses were talking about the Burke Drive. And my Uncle Chino was the one that, that was also out there registering people to vote, telling you, you've got to vote, you've got to become citizens. Before it became the new vote to become citizens, we're talking about, you know, 1955, he was uh, a student of the black movement. And 
and he would say, if the Negroes can do it, we can do it too. The Mexicanos can do it. And he goes, learn from them. They're united. Yep. That's why they, you know, they have a voice. They're united. And everything he tried to do was unite, and he tried to educate people one by one. And I think the thing about my Uncle Chino was when he says, I'm an uneducated man, so I just tell it like it is. And I think that that's why a lot of people always kind of thought, oh, this is nobody. But he got things done. If there was a strike to organize here, he organized the strike. If there was a movement that needed to be, he was organizing the movement. When my Uncle Chino passed away, just to tell you, the street was lined, first street was lined, and Cesar Chavez carried his casket. From the church to From the, the church to the cemetery. It was a sight to be seen because that, I mean, there was just people walking the street, no cars. It was people walking the street to the cemetery. And Cesar Chavez just said, this man worked every day of his life. And he was sick. He had been sick since he was like a teenager. My mom said he always had his asthma. Yeah, he always had his asthma, and she said, but he never stopped. And like I said, he raised the 14 kids, and just a couple of weeks ago, I think it was on the 11th of yeah. March, um, the uh, migrant farm workers, uh, United Farm Workers, bought the um, IWF apartments and refurbished them and redid each apartment very nicely, as a matter of fact. And they rededicated those apartments as the Donicio Vasquez, Chino Vasquez um, apartments in, in his memory and in his honor for everything he did, not only with the United Farm Workers, but for people and the people's movement for housing and for working and workers' rights and everything else. So when you talk about somebody that really made an impact in, in this South community it, at every level, I have to think of my Uncle Chino, because he did make that impact at every level. Well, I just want to say that um, the uh, Eleanor mentioned that it was 1986 with the South County Housing. Maybe that's when you became part of it. We started in the 60s, and uh, Burke Drive was in the 60s, and Chino was part of it in the 60s, not the 80s. That was that, but she's talking about no, South but let County me tell you, Housing. Let me tell my story. Yes. Okay. And uh, there were some Hispanics in Gilroy that supposedly were into the Chicano movement. 